We're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel here on ThinkTech Global. And we have the honor of Russell Liu, who's one of our longtime contributors uh, over many years, who is a lawyer from Hawaii, who has uh, been practicing in China for, gee, quite some time. 13 years. 13 yeah. years. That's a long time. He's been totally uh, com conversant with uh, Mandarin and with things Chinese. He's been all over China and understands China better than most people who have not done what he has done. Um, and um, we'd like to talk to him today about uh, Trump's first 100 days and uh, some of the trade policy statements that he was making in his campaign over the past year and uh, some of the moves he ostensibly will make uh, after inauguration. I, I like, Jay, what you talk about the first 100 days. He's not elected yet, but we are actually in the first 100 days, the things that he's done already. We are. He started his first 100 days right after election day. And so you, you customarily you give a, uh, a winning candidate um, uh, 100, 100 days, a honeymoon, right? So his honeymoon has already started. And um, we ought to measure that 100 days by not January 21st, but by uh, November 9th, I think. Anyway, Russell, um, you have a lot of thoughts about this. Let's back it up a little bit and try to talk about before Trump, BT. Uh, what was American policy like? What was the sensibility of the country about doing trade with China? Well, we have always had this uh, one China policy, and I think recently um, the um, telephone call that Donald Trump uh, received from the head of Taiwan uh, throws into question that policy that's been existing. Under that policy, as it has been peace, stability, uh, uh, economic trade has flourished. Uh, and um, now uh, with that call, that set off a chain of events. And also uh, recently, uh, Donald Trump, president-elect, has named uh, a new head of the Trade Council, a newly created uh, office that's going to work closely with the executive office. Uh, and uh, the uh, person, his name is Peter Navarro, who is widely known as a critic of China. Well, I mean, it all follows what we saw. Um, as I recall, what happened is he got a call from uh, the prime minister of uh, Taiwan. President. President, excuse me. Uh, President of Taiwan, who c was supposed to be uh, supposedly congratulating him, he took the call. I mean, it wasn't very diplomatic to do that, given, you know, the, the diplomatic considerations uh, with China. And then, uh, when he was criticized for it, he uh, he turned against China and made some statements about how China is taking all our uh, manufacturing jobs away, and uh, we shouldn't be sympathetic to them in this matter. And uh, that was, uh, in my view, that was a, a greater transgression because that heated up a battle, a diplomatic battle anyway, between, and a trade battle between the U.S. Uh, and uh, China. So, because, you know, it seems like we've always had a kind of, in recent years, we've had a kind of discomfort with, um, with China. And a lot of people in the country, especially the people who voted for Trump, feel that it wasn't a good idea because it wasn't a good idea to do trade with them because, um, you know, they would take our jobs and uh, we'd be buying all their manufactured goods from them and we wouldn't have the jobs to go along with it and so forth. Um, and so now that he has come into office and he has appointed this guy, Navarro, uh, who is a basically anti-trade with China person, uh, we, we have an idea about what Trump is going to do uh, when he get when he gets uh, inaugurated, what do you think he's going to do based on his statements and that appointment? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, it's important to look at Peter Navarro, uh, who's going to hold a very important position and an important voice in the Trump administration. Um, and we look prior to his appointment for this new Trade Council. What are his thoughts? And it's it's amazing because in 2013, in an article that he wrote in the New York Times in a co-op uh, uh, editorial, and he wrote buying made in China. Uh, and he, what he did was said that uh, buying uh, things made in China hurts our economy and it's killing our economy. So we're going to look and see and talk about his mindset. Uh, I think that there's a lot of fallacy to that because for many years, uh, made in China uh, are not made by, products are not made by government companies in China, as Peter Navarro has insinuated or has presumed. All the products that are brought back into the U.S., most of them, over half of them, are made by U.S. companies that are in China. 
So it has nothing to do with government companies in China. Um, his point of view is that the, these government companies in China uh, are making things that are killing our children. Uh, and, um, and it's hurting what our economy. What a grand economy. generalization that is, eh? That's, that, that's <laughs> dangerous, uh, Jay. <laughs> that's very dangerous. Um, and in fact, um, he ins also insinuated that uh, Americans are, are, are working with the Chinese companies and joint ventures uh, to make these products. But in fact, um, government companies in China um, rarely will do a joint venture um, with an American company unless the American company seeks to manufacture or provide a service in China, not the U.S. So we're not talking about imports are made by joint venture companies. Most companies in China, I've been there for a number of years, Jay, I work with uh, foreign companies, multinationals. They look to incorporate in China, but they're the 100% shareholder of the Chinese entity that makes the products that sends it back over to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I think he's going he's gonna to turn the screws down on, on trade with China. Uh, what specifically would he do? Uh, would he impose tariffs on Chinese goods? Is that what we have in store? I, that's a good question, Jay. So what he's proposing to do is to jack up the tariffs, to equalize the same tariffs that Chinese uh, throw on American products. So they're going to well, jack up the Isn't that fair? What's well, good for the goose and the gander? Isn't that fair? Well, again, again, that hurts uh, Americans because, let's, let's, let's think about it for a second. If you jack up the tariffs, that means you're going to have less imports coming to China, into the U.S. Or the prices of the product of Chinese will be a higher priced. And you're going to, what's going to happen from a macroeconomic point of view is that there's going to be less <coughs> consumer spending. Consumer spending is a key indicator. That, and that's one side of it. But what about the other side? You know, if, if, if they charge a higher tariff than we do, or it, tariffs in general, than we charge, then what we're saying is, uh, you know, uh, th well, what's happening is w that limits our ability to sell our goods in China, okay, and it, but it uh, gives them greater capacity to sell their goods in the U.S. And so, you know, the average person would say, well, that's not really fair, even-minded. Why, why, why can't it be across the board or tariff-free even? So that the, neither side has an advantage. Well, I think, I think it's important to realize that China is still a developing country. If you look at the trade policies that the U.S. has around the world, uh, the uh, tariffs usually are higher on the developing countries to enter the market. Mm. But let's take another look. Living on the ground in China, think about this from a business perspective. What kind of products enter a developing country like China? What sells? The iPhone. What sells? A Mac computer. You're talking about things that are higher priced, and people pay the price for that. They will pay the money in China for that. Mm -hmm. You're not talking about slippers. Americans manufacture slippers sending to China. You can't do that because the they, American companies won't make any money. So it's always the higher item goods that there's still a market demand for it because um, that's where I think you don't understand it unless you're in China and you see that. They will pay the price for a higher uh, product, up, uh, better quality product in China. And the also is true is, is with the big Chinese outbound travel tourism market, they have a dream list of things they want to buy. They come to the U.S. and buy a lot of Apple things. They buy things that maybe in China, because the tariff may be a higher price, they'll pay the price and they'll come here and spend the money. So, and again, that is another thing you need to look at. And you have to understand that helps their economy. That's exports, basically, when sure they come is. here and, and when they, they buy, come here and buy and, and buy and pay sales tax or gross excise tax and all of that. Yeah, sure. So, but you know, assuming that um, he changes the tariff structure and imposes tariffs or greater tariffs on Chinese goods coming into this country, making it more difficult for, more expensive for, um, you know, the consumers in this country to, to buy those goods. What's the net effect? What's the net effect on both countries, can you say? Okay, first let's look at the U.S. I think the first thing that you have to understand economics. When you start to kill uh, imports of Chinese products into the U.S., consumer spending in the U.S. goes down. Consumer spending goes down, okay? When you have consumer spending, that raises the GDP. When you, when you start to kill consumer spending, things get more expensive, that lowers the GDP. 
that's very important to realize from an economic point of view. Mm -hmm. The second thing I think from the China side is that um, it gives a lot of strength to, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk politics, I'm not a politician, mm -hmm. but it, in one sense it makes a stronger China nationalism. And when you make that happen, they will start to buy less American goods, period, even the high-end goods. And, and that's going to be a problem. So it's a trade, not a trade war, but a tariff war. Yes. And so a tariff war is going to have, um, you know, an effect on the average Chinese person. And he's going, to, he's going to want to be loyal to China, and he's going to want to take it out on the U.S. for attacking him with higher, higher tariffs. And I think, I think, I think that there, there's an effect that, that you can understand if you're on the ground in China and you realize that. Mm -hmm. that there'll be more domestic spending for, from uh, domestic brands. And, and that's not how it should work in, in, this, in the uh, scheme of uh, greater things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that's what would happen. What, what else could uh, Trump do about this? It's, I can't think of anything else aside from tariffs. Is there, are there other statements, uh, other uh, mechanics that he could install in, in order to uh, you know, follow through on his threats of limiting uh, the importation of uh, Chinese manufactured well, goods? Well, I, I think we've got to understand the bigger picture. This is why we're called global world. Okay. Um, no matter what you do to China, if you start to close a spigot and we become more isolationist, yeah. India, Brazil, yeah. all these countries around the world that now have internet, they have yeah. access to knowledge, yeah. they're going to go global. And we're going to be in this mode where the U.S., we're not going to go global. I think one of the failed economic policies, we failed to make our, build our capacity to become global, not only, you know, being uh, a U.S. Uh, knowledge base, but we need to be global uh, because around the world, everybody else is, is changing. They're going to become global. Well, I hear you're talking about, uh, you know, not only not raising tariffs, but, you know, taking tariffs off of being TPP, you know, free, free, free trade kind of arrangement. You think we could do that with China? Would it work out for us to do that with China? You mean to... to no tariffs. No tariffs. Free trade. Uh, you know, take the concept of the Trans-Pacific Partner uh, Agreement and, and put it, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. and China. Well, let's look at what happens if we have the TPP, and then, then we can understand that better, Jay. If we have the TPP, and the Chinese have been, have been actually geared up for the TPP several years ago, if we have the TPP, China's not included, what does that mean? Chinese investments are going to go all over in South America, Central America, Mexico and Chinese companies will localize. They will become 100% shareholder and create their own Central American, South American company. And we have the existing NAT, uh, NAFTA uh, framework. We have the CAFTA, which says that Central American uh, countries and Mexican companies will be uh, tariff-free. So they will boost these third world countries and they will get their products through that channel. So that means that we, as Americans, are probably going to lose a lot out of that because the Chinese will still be able to operate yeah, in the global yeah, things. They'll operate back doors. Back doors. And, and through other countries and other arrangements. And one of the things, in, from a political, geopolitical point of view for Americans, uh, I'm not a, f a foreign uh, expert on uh, diplomacy, but a, a stronger Central America, South America, is that good for the U.S.? I say yes, but, but maybe some people in Washington, D.C. would say no. We, we, they may become a threat to us. Well, I, you know, what I hear you saying, and I mean, it's, a, it's a really s seductive possibility, is forget about tariffs. Everybody free trade. And maybe that's, you know, the future of the world. That's the global, you know, end game here, that we all drop tariffs and we trade freely around the world. Uh, what happens if we do that? Would, would Trump's, uh, you know, uh, concern about manufacturing in this country, um, you know, be realized? Uh, will we be able to manufacture competing against wages in every low-wage country? Uh, shouldn't we be concerned? Is he right about that? Well, I, I, think, I, think, I think every country, um, you know, has the discretion or the sovereignty to, to set tariffs. And I think there's good reasons for setting tariffs. Um, yes, and to some point you protect domestic jobs, but the world is becoming global. But let, let's look at it one step further. Uh, with the tariffs, uh, you know, how much 
the tariffs are going to be will affect the consumer spending because less Im imports will come into the country. Um, but maybe having some tariffs is important because then it, in a Chinese business mind, okay, China's policy now is to move up the value chain. High technology, it doesn't have it. Uh, management processes, it doesn't have, okay. But through the years, because of multinationals investing in China, they have great uh, manufacturing uh, uh, understanding of how to do manufacturing operations. They've got the latest equipment in China. What happens now is that Okay, labor cost is rising in China. It's still a young country. So that means we take our Chinese uh, operations, now move it into the U.S. We have a higher-end product that we can now justify with high labor costs in China. Now we said in the U.S. we cut the distribution cost and we'll give more to the American worker. We'll create a job. Case in point, a few weeks ago we brought up uh, Fuyao Glass Company, the billionaire who's, uh, who, multi-billionaire, who's investing a billion dollars and he's revived uh, and bought uh, two former GM plants and is bringing his glass company t to the U.S. It's going to be an American company that creates several thousand jobs. Think about that. Uh, so we are, should be welcoming that kind of investment. But if we start to do a trade policy and start to restrict Chinese goods, high tariffs, remember one thing is that f for any country, for China, the money that will leave China to invest in the U.S. is regulated by the government. And pretty soon, the government may not approve that investment to the U.S. We kill our foreign direct the government investment. Government can control it. Can the government end of control the day, it. The government can control it. And besides that, the second point of view is that in a culture society where the U.S. is bashing China, do you think that Chinese businessmen will want to go to the U.S.? No, they don't want to because they will be in their society. They will be on a list of of of, of maybe. Uh, on, on the people's list that we won't support this company anymore. Yeah, because it's, it's not only the business, it's not patriotic. Maybe everybody, and maybe everybody, including Xi Jinping. Let's take a short break, Russell. We'll come back and talk about, you know, what happens if Donald Trump um, implements his plan to limit uh, imports from China into the United States. We'll be right back after this break. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what is likable about science. We bring on scientists of all ilk, astronomers, physicists, chemists, biologists, ecologists, and they talk about their work, and more importantly, they talk about why you should talk about their work, why you should think about their work, why you should like their work. I help them bring out why their work is understandable, why it's meaningful, why people should care about it, why people should support science. We have a good time. We talk about current uh, events of interest. We talk about uh, historical events sometimes. We dig deep into their research, why they do, what the joys and delights and frustrations of their work are. And in all, we, we show a, a real world of science, a real world of likable science. I hope you'll join us every Friday at 2 p.m. We're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech Global. And my guest is a uh, actually our host, <laughs> Russell, <host Jay. laughs> Russell Liu, who's a Hawaii lawyer who has been practicing in, in Beijing for, what, 13 years and who knows the territory there, and is concerned along with the rest of us about Donald Trump's plan to, um, uh, to cut trade with China effectively by tariffs or otherwise. So uh, let, me, let me just uh, summarize what I think he was saying before, was that if we, if we block importation of Chinese goods in this country. There are some very negative effects to us. It's not clear that we would be improving, increasing our manufacturing capacity, but it is clear that people would spend, that the prices would be higher of things we customarily do buy through those channels. And just taking the laws of economics, people would not pay the higher prices. And uh, although Donald Trump could afford to pay the higher prices, mm -hmm. uh, the average Joe, even in a, in a community that voted for him, uh, would would buy less. And if people buy less, then you have a, a you know smaller economic um, development, and um, and the whole supply chain uh, begins to lose revenue, and uh, GDP is thus made smaller. What's more is, is the secondary effect, and that is. Uh, if you get into a tariff war or take these adverse negative steps toward trade with China, they are going to respond. And it's the response I'd like to talk to you about. It's the response you mentioned just before the break of 
people um, not being willing to come to the U.S. Uh, from China, not being willing to make investments as they have been in the U.S., taking steps, you know, that are adverse to us. Uh, and of course, there's, there's uh, Xi Jinping, who was not born yesterday. Xi Jinping is a tough character, and he is not going to stand by. Uh, he's going to make his own plan. My understanding of his technique is that he's a long plan kind of guy, very Chinese kind of characteristic. And uh, he is not going to just uh, let Donald Trump or do what Donald Trump wants. Uh, all the press beating in Washington isn't going to affect him. Uh, Xi Jinping will find a way um, to deal with us, and we won't necessarily like it. Am I right about that? You're right, Jay. I think l let's really think about it for a second, okay? Let's really think about the dynamics, how business is done in Asia, which is very important, okay? Um, we're talking about um, higher tariffs for China so that the Chinese products can enter the U.S. Think for a second, okay? What kind of products come into the U.S. these days made from China? We talk about, oh, these things that go to Walmart, uh, Costco, cheap things. But the truth of the fact, being in China 13 years, there's a shift. All the law in manufacturing is moving towards Southeast Asia. It's not coming from China, okay? So it means that, um, uh, you know, it will, won't may have that much effect because the goods that are coming from China are not going to be what it used to be 20 years ago, low-end manufacturing cheap stuff, okay? So, so how is that going to affect the U.S. economy? But second thing to, to point out is that from an economic point of view, um, it means that if we start to um, put a tariff war in effect, Chinese products that come here, uh, uh, there is going to be less consumer spending here. Consumer spending doesn't benefit China, it benefits the U.S. Well, the supply line. Here. The it supply chain. The supply. And all the people who work in all the Walmart stores and all the stores in general that sell Chinese goods, would, you know, they might lose their jobs and those stores would lose revenue and so you have an adverse effect on that level. We, st we start to kill that. Prices are going to be higher. People are not spending. Yeah. Our GDP is going to go down. At the same time, this doesn't necessarily mean uh, that our manufacturing capacity will increase. And I mean, I think, I think one of the things that Trump and his friends are saying is that if you cut off the Chinese goods, we, we, are, some gonna, we are somehow going to increase our manufacturing capacity. I'm not sure that's true. Do you think it's true? That's a great uh, observation, Jay. Do we have the money to build the capacity? Do we have the manufacturing capacity? Do we have the know-how? China has actually acquired uh, that know-how in the last 20 years. We stopped manufacturing some time ago. We, we have to begin from you know, from square one here and learn how to do it again, especially in goods that are, you know, sophisticated goods that they are building for us now. Exactly. So and, we're... And, mm -hmm. You know, I, I like to, you know, go to the point, and it's right, right here on this, on this question, is technology. You know, in the, at the end of the day, it's not necessarily the cost of labor. It's the power of the technology. You can mm -hmm. build an automated plant these days. It doesn't require a lot of labor. And so the guy that builds the automated plant. So if the U.S. wants to be, um, wants to recover its manufacturing prowess in the world, it should apply the technology to the manufacturing. In some quarters, this is already happening. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, um, you know, if I were advising Trump, I would say, why don't you encourage that instead of bashing China? Mm -hmm. Why don't you encourage manufacturing by incentivizing technology in manufacturing in this country? And the question behind it is, who has the money? to bring that technology now. Who has that the money investors and, from and China. investors from China? <laughs> so you see where I'm getting at the point is that we will have a failed policy because we won't have the money to build a capacity. We've lost a capacity over 30 years ago, Jay. And all of that has been invested in China. The latest state of art manufacturing equipment, the quality control, and it's not necessarily giving jobs to Chinese because with high technology it means it has been actually reducing and limiting number of jobs in China, high labor costs in China, but now we're going to kill that investment that comes into the U.S. A billion and dollars... The Chinese companies the are Chinese companies, factories here. That's right. Yeah. And we should be encouraging that. But if we do a trade war, uh, the sum of all things, I think it's going to, we're going to uh, lose out because our GDP is going to decrease. We're not going to be able to attract foreign investment money into this country, Chinese money. And that's important. I mean, we have changed the curve from the 70s and 80s. Peter Navarro is thinking about 70s and 80s when Americans went and spent money in China. And then remember one thing, when the WTO came into effect, 
than Chinese companies in 2004. I mean, excuse me, foreign companies, American companies in China, now didn't have to do joint ventures. They did what is called woofies, and they're basically an American company operating in China. Mm -hmm. And with that increase in technology, it means they weren't paying a lot more for labor-intensive things. Those jobs are going to Southeast Asia, to Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia. They're not doing that. So what we want from the Chinese, investment money, we want to know what the, what's going on in the factories, the, you know, the, that, that higher-end equipment to be brought to the U.S. And we need to gear up our manufacturing capacity, which we can't do alone. Yeah, I, I mean, even, even a great idea about technology still requires investment. So, uh, but back to Xi Jinping for a minute. He's nobody's fool. Smart guy, powerful guy in China. He's consolidated his power. He's now talking about disregarding the succession rules. And he wants to be, um, he wants to go for a third term, despite, you know, the rules that call for him to leave after the second term. So this, you know, this, this is a very powerful guy getting more powerful. Um, this is a great issue for him to have on his plate because he can use it as a scapegoat issue and scapegoat the United States the same way, uh, you know, these guys, Navarro is scapegoating China, as <laughs> a matter of fact. So the question I, and I, I ask you, and this is a hard one, is uh, what, what will he do? What will he do to neutralize the efforts of this administration to cut imports from China? Well, <coughs> I think what's going to happen is when you start to cut the Chinese, you know, exports to the U.S., it, it, I think a number of things are going to happen. Chinese uh, China may start to close its borders with regulations, making it difficult for American companies to invest in China. The biggest markets are in China for American companies. Not the U.S. The biggest markets are in China. 1.4 billion people. And, and th that's a tremendous market. When you start cutting access, who are you going to hurt? In American this companies. Trying American to sell companies. Things in China. American companies. And, and so this is not necessarily strictly an economic game or a tariff game. This is diplomatic, diplomatic moves by closing markets, by uh, pre preventing the sale of goods at all mm -hmm. in in, uh, in China. Um, they could, these, he could do draconian things to affect the ability of our companies uh, selling or manufacturing, for that matter, in China. And, um, you know, it, it, we've seen that before. It's kind of a tit-for-tat thing that China sometimes play. You want to mess That's with right. us, we mess with you. And I suspect that exact thing will happen here if Donald Trump do, does what he is suggesting. You know, and it's interesting to, to think about for a second since President Obama came into office, many people are, get very emotional and say we're in the worst off, but the statistics don't lie. You look at the unemployment rate. At a time he came into office in 2008, inherited the, the big economic fallout uh, under the prior president's watch. And the question is, has unemployment rates gone up or gone down? And they've drastically gone down. Look at uh, the stock market. Has the stock market gone up or down? It really has gone way up. That's a sign of, of a healthy economy. That's a sign of a healthy economy because we had a s healthy relationship with China. Think about that for a second. Well, mostly, but I think it, that relationship has suffered since November 8th. And in fact, it suffered during the campaign when Trump was making his anti-Chinese remarks. So, um, you know, I think we're not only talking about the pure economics and the tariffs and the, and the manufacturing companies and the, and the restoration of um, manufacturing capacity in this country or the pr protection of markets, our markets there. We're talking about the whole enchilada, the relationship of the U.S. and China. If we, if we uh, bash them, they will bash us, and we will not necessarily come out the winner on that. Um, this kind of challenge thing, and, and he's doing the same thing, Trump, uh, in his tweets and all, uh, with Putin on uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, proliferation. And so I think, you know, the, these things do not necessarily play in our favor. Not to say that everything that uh, Obama did was right, um, but, you know, if you disrupt things this way, and you get into contentions around the world, diplomatically and nationally in terms of the, the feeling of the populations in this country or that country uh, and the and the the steps that are justified the you know the the um, the payback steps that are justified by public opinion 
we don't come out ahead on that. That's right. And, and let's take a look at back in, in a, a few years back. It, this is very, uh, it reminds us of Japan in the 70s and 80s when we started having a lot of Japanese cars and we started bashing Japan. Think about it for a second, okay? Uh, and we started to want to change our economic policy in the scheme of things. If we were successful bashing Japan, we wouldn't have Toyota Honda plants in the U.S. We wouldn't have jobs. We wouldn't have an a, a auto industry. To some extent, you've got to realize that helps support the auto industry when our own American manufacturers were starting to have economic Absolutely. Loans. And a number Think of about communities it. depend on it. A number of communities. And the know. industry depends on it, and uh, it, it has worked well. So we should learn by that experience. Learn by it. We're, we're getting into this paranoia again, this paranoia uh, that they are foreigners, you know, and that they're, they're going to take over, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I, think, so I think... It goes back uh, hundreds of years, you know. A, that's the point. It goes back... The yellow peril. The yellow that. peril. <laughs> and, you know, but, but think about this. We, we come from a, uh, a society that's based on a lot of European civilization. Washington, D.C. is based out that. Leaders, we come from a, a lot of European heritage. And you take a look in Europe, tell me which country didn't go around the world to bash people <laughs> and then to, to, to do military conflict. We had, the, sorry, we had the Vikings from Norway, Sweden, right? We had the Spaniards, we had the English, we had the French, we had the Portuguese. And think about that. It's the same mentality that we are on top of the world and we tend to then become isolationists in some sense. Doesn't pay. Doesn't pay in the long not, run. Not in the 21st century. Because it surely doesn't pay. It's, we're global. There's internet. There's technology. So what's happened is the curve, the game has changed because everybody in Asia and China 40 years ago made it mandatory for their students, the young people, to learn English. They read the internet. They understand English. They know the, the game of, of businesses is English. And so they see what's going on. So they're creating global networks. They're creating global uh, companies. So where are we in the scheme of things? We've done the opposite. We've sat here thinking we're the greatest, and now we're going to be more isolationist by causing trade wars. We're going to lose friends around the world. The Chinese will, will gain a lot of friends going to South America, Central America, other if you want to, If you want to survive, prevail on a global basis in, in the global economy, you've got to compete. And you can't be isolationist and compete. Russell, this is a great discussion. We have to continue this discussion. There's much more to come, and we have to compare notes right after January 20, 21st. Great. We'll see where the first 100 days has gone. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank Russell. you, Jay. Russell Liu, a lawyer from Hawaii doing practice in Beijing.